Hello again. So if you've uh, been with me this far, I'm going to go ahead and assume that uh, you understand how Richard Wright puts his book together. He's got two parts to it. Uh, the first part is his life in the South uh, as an early adolescent. And then the second part is his move to the North, in particular Chicago. Um, once again, there's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of things that really lend themselves to the issues, concepts, and events that we've been studying in this class for the last few weeks. And so we're going to explore many of them here in this video segment. You got to understand that the racial reality uh, in the South, really from the end of Reconstruction, so 1877, well through the post-World War II era, is simply abysmal. Uh, we've talked about this in earlier segments of this series, how there really wasn't any infraction that a white person could be uh, charged with uh, inflicting upon a black person. Uh, blacks were expected to not only acknowledge white supremacy, but really kind of um, uh, accept their second or third class citizenship with, um, with, with a smile on their face. So you have to uh, appreciate how many of these people that are living in conditions like this would look upon a place like New York, Chicago, Detroit, with a lot of interest. In short, there's this perceived freedom that exists in the North. There's things that you can do, like vote. Uh, you could send your kid to school in the North. Um, you know, in a place like Chicago, you can sit on the L train, you can sit right next to a white person and strike up a conversation, which of course is not something that you would ever do in Mississippi, at least in that period. And so, you know, in, in our class, we, we've talked about this a couple times, and we've labeled these processes the Great Migration. Great Migration of African Americans from the Rural South to the Urban North and a little bit later to the West Coast as well. We've talked about the issues that have spurred these Great Migrations. Uh, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that uh, both world wars are a spark plug to the movement of African Americans out of the South. In 1914, when World War I really gets going in Europe, uh, production ramps up in Detroit, in New York, in Cleveland, and somebody's got to fill those jobs. African Americans begin to stream up to take those jobs in those industries because there is an opportunity there combined with this perceived freedom that exists in those cities. Uh, same thing happens in World War II, what we'll call the Second Great Migration, only this time you begin to see people flock to places like Los Angeles and San Francisco as well, because both of those cities were centers of war production, especially for the Navy. In any case, um, we have seen African Americans, for lack of a better term, vote with their feet. Uh, we don't like it here in the South, uh, we're not treated well, we're not valued, and we're going to leave. And in certain instances, you see entire black churches just simply uproot themselves and relocate themselves to the urban north or to the west coast. And you can see this here in Richard Wright as well. So what I want you to do is take out your book, whether that is the book that we provided you uh, online, or that's a brick and mortar book like, uh, like the one that I'm using here. Um, in any case, I want you to open it up to chapter 14. It's at the very beginning of chapter 14. And uh, if you're using the book that we gave you, that would be page 237, 237. Um, it, there's a paragraph that um, uh, starts, it's, toward, it's a couple paragraphs in, it starts out, next loomed the problem of leaving. Next lo loomed the problem of leaving. He's contemplating a move out of the South, and in particular, he seems to be headed to Chicago, okay? So, you know, there's a little bit of dialogue here, but I'm going to go ahead and take this up to give you a quick example. Next loomed the problem of leaving my job cleanly, smoothly, without arguments or scenes. How could I present the fact of leaving to my boss? Yes, I would pose as an innocent boy. I would tell him that my aunt was taking me and my paralyzed mother to Chicago. That would create in his mind the impression that I was not asserting my will. It would block any expression of dislike on his part for my act. 
I knew that Southern whites hated the idea of Negroes leaving to live in places where the racial atmosphere was different. It worked as I planned. When I broke the news of my leaving two days before I left, I was afraid to tell it sooner for fear that I would create hostility on the part of the whites with whom I worked. The boss leaned back in his swivel chair and gave me the longest and most considerate look he had ever given me. Chicago, he repeated softly. Yes, sir. Boy, you won't like it up there, he said. Well, I have to go where my family is, sir, I said. The other white office workers paused in their tasks and listened. I grew self-conscious, tense. It's cold up there, he said. Yes, sir, they say it is, I said, keeping my voice in neutral tone. Now, I'm skipping down a little bit further for the sake of time. Um, you think you'll do any better up there? He asked. I don't know, sir. You seem to have been getting along all right down here, he said. Oh, yes, sir. If it wasn't for my mother going, I'd stay right here and work. I lied as earnestly as possible. Well, why not stay? You can send her money, he suggested. He, he had trapped me. I knew that staying now would never do. I could not have controlled my relations with the whites if I had remained after having told them I wanted to go north. Well, I want to be with my mother, I said. You want to be with your mother, he repeated idly. Well, Richard, we enjoyed having you here with us. And so understand that this is a bold move on the part of those people like him that decided to participate in what we'll call the Great Migration. Um, but it's one of those moves that if you can pull it off, uh, there is this perceived freedom that exists in the North um, that simply does not exist uh, where he is right now, and he wants to take advantage of that. I'm going to fast forward a little bit about, you know, how he finds a job in Chicago and what he does but let's just say that he enters into Chicago with an enormous amount of hope. I mean, part of this, you got to understand what Chicago meant to thousands and thousands of black people. New York, too. I mean, really was the land of opportunity that anybody with a hard work ethic, a good attitude, and a little bit of talent could ply their trade and could, could, could really make it. It really was the essence of the equality of opportunity. But if you've been with us for a while, you know that there's a northern racism that might not be as covert and obvious as the counterpart in the south, but believe me, it's there. And Richard Wright begins to pick up on this covert northern racism as well. And I want to give you one example. Open up your book or turn the page over to uh, chapter 15. And in particular, I want you to open to page 246, 246. Now, he is, he, he's using parentheses here a lot, so that's not going to help too much. But look for that paragraph that starts out, to solve this tangle of balked emotion, to solve this tangle of balked emotion. Find that. I want to give you uh, an example uh, of this, you know, revelation that he's coming to, that the North is really not that much better than the South when it comes to racial attitudes. So here we go. To solve this tangle of balked emotion, I loaded the empty part of the ship of my personality with fantasies of ambition to keep it from toppling over into the sea of selflessness. Like any other American, I dreamed of going into business and making money. I dreamed of working for a firm that would allow me to advance until I reached an important position. I dreamed of organizing secret groups of blacks to fight all the whites. And if blacks would not agree to organize, then they would have to be fought. I would end up again with self-hate, but it was now a self-hate that was projected outward upon other blacks. Yet I knew with that part of my mind that the whites had given me that none of my dreams were possible. I want you to go to the next paragraph here. It starts out, slowly I began. Slowly, I began to forge in the depths of my mind a mechanism that repressed all the dreams and desires that Chicago streets, the newspapers, the movies were evoking in me. I was going through a second childhood. A new sense of the limit of the possibility was being born in me. What could I dream of that had been barest possibility of coming true? I could think of nothing. 
and slowly it was upon exactly these nothingness that my mind began to dwell that constant sense of wanting without having of being hated without reason a dim notion of what life meant to a negro in america was coming to conscious in me not in terms of external events lynchings jim crowism and the endless brutalities but in terms of crossed up feelings of psychic pain i sensed that negro life was a sprawling land of unconscious suffering and there were but few negroes who knew the meaning of their lives who could tell their story a, a couple things i think what he's telling you there is that he's beginning to put two and two together that that this racist attitude does exist amongst northerners it's not as easy to identify as as when he was living in mississippi but it's there L let's interrogate this a little bit further in the context of our class with respect to the great migrations it's not long thereafter that you see what we described as race riots in 1919 you've got a race riot in chicago um, that race riot, if you recall, really began when there was a competition for resources, and not really just jobs and housing, although certainly you could point to those as well. It was space on the beach of Lake Michigan. Keep in mind, the lake was one of the only forms of recreation that was cheap and accessible, and people wanted to use it, but it was very racialized, and you were not supposed to be on certain parts of the beach if you weren't of a specific racial tone. So, you know, it's not as free and as open as people would like to make it believe. And, you know, that guy that was skipping stones out there because he was angry at those four African-American kids in what he perceived to be his part of the beach, that's ultimately what kicks off the Chicago 1919 race riot. You also have hate groups. You know, I, I told you in the 1920s, largely as a response to increased immigration and what was perceived to be a changing culture, you see a reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan, but it's not in rural Mississippi. You see it in New Jersey and in Indiana and in Michigan and in Illinois. Um, you begin to see a spinoff of the Ku Klux Klan by the 1930s known as the Black Legion. Um, it was a group of people that thought that the Klan had lost its crazy edge and somebody needed to bring it back. And so, you know, when most of us think about white supremacy in the traditional sense, and the Ku Klux Klan comes to our minds, we think of cross burnings in the civil rights era uh, in places like Louisiana or Mississippi. We don't generally think of some of the, uh, you know, the hate crimes that were committed by organizations, terrorist groups like the Black Legion. I mean, 1937 alone, the Black Legion waged a bloody, bloody campaign in Detroit and its and it and its outskirts. So these industrial towns like Chicago and Detroit had more than their fair share of racial hate uh, with respect to uh, what we're talking about. Okay. There's one more example that I'd like you to be mindful of, remind you of rather, and I think you'll get a lot of mileage out of it if you think about it carefully. And that is the restrictive covenants. Do you remember me talking about restrictive covenants? We were talking about it in the context of the 1920s and how there were these agreements, a covenant, between the homeowner and the rest of the neighborhood. And if you ever had to sell your home for whatever reason, you would only sell it to a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant family, okay? Restrictive covenants would be more or less a mainstay that would keep neighborhoods exclusively white and exclusively Protestant. And a lot of times Jews and Catholics were not welcome either. But in any case, they're going to exist for the next several decades. And ultimately, what this is going to do, after you see not just one, but two great migrations, it's going to trap people of color, especially African Americans, in these urban centers. Only this time around, the jobs have changed very much, and you no longer can get a job the way that Jurgis Rudkus did when he showed up in Chicago. Now you need a skill. You need to be able, uh, able to manipulate a machine or you need to be like an accountant or something like that to take advantage of that kind of economy. And so you're going to be trapped in what historians call an urban crisis 
Uh, there's no jobs to absorb you. The living conditions in places like Detroit and Chicago have completely eroded. You'd like to get out, but the suburbs are not welcoming. And so you're trapped in this crisis where you don't have a whole lot of prospects and you have a dilapidated city infrastructure. Okay, So it's not just a connection to what we're talking about with Richard Wright. It's also a connection and a way to understand uh, how we got to this point how you know it's very difficult to make it in america uh when you're penned up and you're, you're you're confined in the way that the urban crisis can find people there's one more example of casual northern racism that i'd like you to be mindful of and that's going to come to you in the next chapter which is chapter 17 actually yeah it is chapter 17 so open up your books to uh page 277 and i want to take you through this last um, example uh, that will involve his work in a, um, I think it's a veterinary clinic. You know, in Chicago, he bounces around from job to job a little bit, but uh, eventually he kind of settles in as a veterinary uh, um, um, helper. He, he's basically like a cleaner or an, an assistant. So on 277, there's a paragraph that begins, when I began working at the Institute, find that paragraph. When I began working at the Institute, I recalled my adolescent dream of wanting to be a medical research worker. Daily, I saw young Jewish boys and girls receiving instruction on chemistry and medicine that the average black boy or girl could never receive. When I was alone, I wandered and poked my fingers into strange chemicals, watched intricate machines trace red and black lines upon ruled paper. At times I paused and stared at the walls of the rooms, at the floors, at the wide desk at which the white doctor sat. I realized without feeling that I could never quite get used to, that was, looking at the wor world of another race. So if you read through the next paragraph, ultimately um, he, he's going to ask a question of this white doctor. It's a, it's a sentence, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to find this one. It's a sentence that begins, but when I ask a timid question, try to find that. But when I asked a timid question, I found that even Jewish doctors had learned to imitate the statistic method of humbling a Negro that the native born whites had cultivated. In other words, these Jewish doctors had learned to become racist. Learned to become dismissive of African Americans, looked to see them, or learned to see them as the help, that they could never have a role of being the actual veterinarian or doctor. And, uh, you know, that was something that was picked up once these um, uh, Jewish transplants had kind of learned how American racism worked. So go to the next page. Um, you know, th there's a, a very graphic scene here of what they're doing to these dogs. But uh, there's a paragraph that starts out, to me, uh, Nimbutal was a powerful, to me, Nimbutal was a powerful and mysterious liquid. But when I asked questions about its properties, I could not obtain a single intelligent answer. In other words, he's got a chemistry question, right? He wants to know a little bit more about this. The young Jewish doctor simply ignored me with, come on, bring me the next dog. I haven't got all day. It's not that much different than what we were talking about in an earlier segment when that white woman that was going to give him a job said, do you steal? And then got all offended and bent out of shape when he laughed about the ridiculousness of that question. It's really not that different when you stop and think about it. It's an assumed superiority. It's an assumed position and an assumed ceiling that African Americans like Richard Wright have in the context of this, you know, northern utopia i mean keep in mind chicago was looked upon by people like richard wright as you know the land of plenty the land where anybody that was hard working and talented could make it okay one last time around with the class connections in world war ii especially when there was an, an increased need for defense materials long-range bombers, ships, um, aircraft carriers, you name it, um, you see a flood of people into places like Detroit and Cleveland and New York take advantage of these jobs. And one of the first things that African-American transplants from the South 
uh, one of the first things that they noticed about Detroit that was, you know, the arsenal of democracy is that arsenal of democracy wasn't all that democratic, right? People like Ford, people like General Motors, they didn't really want to willingly uh, accept or hire African Americans. They preferred to hire whites. It got so bad, if you remember, that uh, an old African American labor leader by the name of A. Philip Randolph had organized what was going to be a million man march on Washington, D.C. to, you know, convey his frustration over this discrimination. FDR called it off at the 11th hour, and uh, 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 in the process, he passed Executive Order 8802, which forbade any kind of racial or religious discrimination in the defense industries. But it does point out this racist Northern attitude, or maybe that the, the, the racist Northern realities uh, when it comes to discrimination and, uh, you know, who's got an opportunity and, and, and who doesn't. And so, once again, it's, it's, it's the world of white supremacy. It's a very different perspective. It's a very different look at this white supremacy. But nonetheless, as he's pointing out, this revelation that kind of settled upon him when he's coming to the realization that, uh, you know, Chicago is really not that much better. For our final um, installment of this series, we're going to talk about uh, what was perceived to be uh, civil rights activism in the interwar period. And Once again, you're going to see a lot of parallels between Richard Wright and what we've been studying in this class. And once again, you will see a very casual racist attitude to that. More soon.